This is where my people come from. Back when this was all Pangea. Pangea says over me. <laughs> Pangea, we'll meet again. Pangea. Yeah, back when the when the continents quit drifting and they all become one again, I'll be so happy. Pangea, Pangea. I just met a girl named Pangea. All that remains. Oh, it's a sad, sad day. When our ancestors that we come back to celebrate with are gone, gone, gone. They've only been gone 225 million years. Just a fraction of time. See, we just come up to the kitchen. There's the view. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's the outhouse. I can't. I can't zoom in. That's why I keep getting out of focus because I keep zooming with this wide angle lens on. But I leave the wide angle to show you lunch. There's coffee and peanut butter sandwiches. Coffee and lunch. Looking at our surroundings. You know, there is an attic up there. It's too spooky though. That's the outhouse with the coolest view. See, there would be the view if you were pointed that way. Well, that's where we've been making our coffee. And you've been getting yak tape from uh, a possible 359. And yeah, and the tin roof. Those roofs are made out of old coffee cans and ever-ready batteries. See? Yeah, it's covered by Nevada's antiquity at Prestone. And this, anyway, this is like a not so long ago they were using it kind of place, I think. On the tape you got a while back. have screwed up over the years. Custer drove this truck and he and the troopers fell. But of course, my favorite is this. Not this, that's pretty cool too. But this. Yeah, man. Yeah. I said I'll probably burn it. I'll just X out the Donna and Shelby and leave me and Doug in it. The funny guys. The really fun guys. Yeah. I put 
push your dog. Well, we always road. take pictures of wrecked cars in the desert. Why, if you mess with me too much, I'll shove your adobe house over. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's historically fascinating, you guys. Some kind of like old burning man visitor, old dead car thing. There's their pillow and their jacket and the guy's body. And it's in the desert and it's miles from any place. The file is looking for cool stuff. Uh, it's not a dope. Oh, it was used as a dope pipe. Yeah, See? Okay. It was a dime and a penny. So we got paid 11 cents to stop here. It's yeah. pretty good. It's working out pretty good. I don't like to leave the door open when I leave. No, me neither. I'm cool, I'm cool. Get a shot off in the desert. I can already feel that I'm going to turn into an alien soon. I think you are too. Nothing for miles, and look. Look what Philo found. A special map and a film notice. You are now infected with the anthrax virus. But we had to stop at this old dead place. On top of the world. Hi hey guys, we're way up here on the top of the mountain. And uh, trees obscure some of the viewage. But it's pretty spectacular. I can tell you. And there's another ridge right over here. That one up there, I want to climb. You know, there's Philo backing up. Yeah, go Philo, go. Go backwards all the way home. All the way to California. I'll just walk here. I'll be your shadow, man. I won't leave you. I'll just be walking here behind the truck. Don't worry about it. Just we can go all the way to Baghdad, all the way to Barstow, all the way to Kingman City like this. Yeah. Oh, man. I can't do it anymore, man. I can't do it anymore. Uh, I can't. Uh, uh. Fish lizard. That's correct. Now that you got that right, do you know what language? Greek. 
Oh, you fish got it lizard. right. Had a 50-50 chance. <laughs> okay, so this is a fish lizard. This is actually an accurate description of this guy. Because uh, if you notice, he looks a lot like a fish, but uh, he's closer related to a lizard. Uh, does anybody know what Pangea is? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got the ringer in. Yeah. Uh, what's Pangea? It's uh, the ancient... Uh one continent that lived that was before all the tectonic plate movement. Uh, That's right. Uh, scientists believe if you if you look at a globe or a map, all the continents appear to fit together like a big jigsaw puzzle. And scientists believe that about 250 million years ago, they did in fact form one supercontinent called Pangaea. And at that time, California, Oregon, Washington, and most of Nevada was the continental shelf for Pangaea. So where we're standing right now, we were about 200 meters underwater. And then slowly, as, as Pangaea broke apart and the North American continent migrated up to where it is today, a lot of tectonic activity took place where the, the plates were bashing into each other, uh, causing foliations within the continents, which basically is how mountain ranges are formed. And we ended up with an upthrust here. And that's how this ocean dweller ended up at 7,000 feet above sea level where we're standing right now. Um, Ichthyosaurs were one of the most successful animals in history. They lasted about 155 million years. They started out in the Triassic, they extended completely through the Jurassic, and then died out in the late Cretaceous period. Um, they, scientists believe that all life started in the ocean and then progressed out onto land. Scientists also believe that ichthyosaurs were once terrestrial or land walkers and then progressed back into the ocean or returned to the ocean, uh, probably due to the abundance of food. And that's re reflected in Shaunosaurus. Uh, by the way, uh, there are about 80 different species of ichthyosaurs ranging anywhere from 2 feet to 50 feet in length. This particular guy is Shaunosaurus popularis. He's named for the Shoshone mountain range that we're standing in right now, and he happens to be the largest ichthyosaur known to man. So uh, what I was saying was that uh, Shaunosaurus has equal sized flippers, which would tend to depict limbs if you believe in that type of stuff. And um, he's the only one with equal sized flippers. So, um, so we see a lot of adaption to their aquatic environment within the species ichthyosauri. I'm sorry, the order ichthyosauri. Um, we start out with, uh, it, it, did anybody notice the skull cast in the cabinet inside in there? That's a skull cast of Simbus pondylus that was found in Lovelock, Nevada. And he is one of the earliest versions of ichthyosaurs known to man. He uh, had a long serpentine tail, so he swam through the water a lot like a crocodile or an alligator um, does today. Then they started to adapt to their aquatic environment. And one of the first things we notice is that they develop a down thrust at the end of the tail. So their, their tail is long and straight, and now it's got a down thrust at the end. And what that down thrust does is now when he swims through the swims through the water, all of the pressure is provided by that lower portion of the tail. It basically creates torque in the mid-torso, which lifts the nose, makes them much lighter and stronger swimmers, much more agile in the water. Once we get to Jurassic ichthyosaurs, uh, they're almost fully adapted to the, their aquatic environment. One of the first things we notice about uh, Jurassic ichthyosaurs is that they lose a lot of their size. The average size of an ichthyosaur is six feet in length. So they basically were filling the ecological niche of the dolphin or the porpoise in today's ecosystem. Uh, keep in mind, this guy is a, a reptile, so he's not related to our sea mammals like whales, dolphins, porpoises. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Anyways, so uh, they lose a lot of their size. Their bodies become... Uh, more teardrop shaped to cut down on the resistance so that they can swim through the water with less effort. Uh, the back flippers, which were never really used for anything, dissolve away to little vesicles or little nodules. Uh, they develop a pronounced or distinct tail fluke, so they have a full crescent moon shaped tail and a dorsal fin to assist with stability. Now, um, uh, unlike dolphins and porpoises and whales, ichthyosaurs didn't have sonar, so they had to rely entirely on sight or vision for hunting their prey. And that's reflected in the enormity of the eye. That eye right there is 12 inches in diameter. Uh, there's another ichthyosaur <coughs> called uh, Temnodontosaurus, and he had the largest eye of any animal living or extinct. It's, it's larger than the giant squid, so it was very significant. The eye also assists with deep dives in murky water where there's very little light. Uh, based on diving animals today, they estimate that ichthyosaurus could dive about 600 meters, which is about 1,800 feet. 
and that they could hold their breath for about 20 minutes. So these guys <laughs> were definitely deep divers. Uh, their primary food source is cephalopods. That's ammonites, biminites, nautiloids, uh, brachiopods. Uh, they did eat bony fish and they did eat little reptiles, so they probably ended up eating little ichthyosaurs. They pretty much were kings of the ocean. They ate what they wanted. Um, does anybody not know what ammonites, biminites, nautiloids are? Somebody raise your hand. Good. Let's go inside and look at some. <laughs> this is an ammonite right here in the front. This is the little squirrely guy. Just so you guys know, the ammonite was a free swimmer. He didn't reside on the bottom. Um, he actually had tentacles, swam through the water column, and then the ichthyosaur would pick him out of the water column. Kind of so, like a nautilus? Like absolutely. Nautilus. Yep. Okay, so this is Simbus pombolus. Remember, I talked about him outside. Uh, dispel a couple of rumors real quick. These two large sockets on top of the head are not the eye sockets. The eyes are around here on the side. Uh, and this little socket, or this little cavity right between those sockets is not a blowhole. They actually had nostrils in front of the eyes. So their faces were a lot like this. Bear with me, it's real small. So they had nostrils. Um, by the way, is this a porpoise, a dolphin? What is this, you guys? Where are you at? The ichthyosaur. It's an ichthyosaur. There you go. Um, he looks like a dolphin or a porpoise. Remember, um, they're almost fully adapted once they get to the Jurassic ichthyosaurs. Uh, the best way you can tell an ichthyosaur from a dolphin or a porpoise is that they have a vertical tail. Um, all your mammals have horizontal tails, so they swim through the water like this, whereas ichthyosaurs go side to side. I've mentioned Simbus pondylus a couple of times, so here's a picture of him. That's this guy right here. Okay, so he has that long serpentine tail and no dorsal fin. Remember, this guy's closer related to a lizard than he is to a mammal or a sea mammal. And what period is that again? Uh, these are Triassic. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. These are Triassic, but they did extend all the way up through the Cretaceous period. And how many years ago is the Triassic? Two hundred and fifty, two hundred and twenty million years ago. Yeah. By the way, this is our guy here. Um, there are three errors on the wall outside. I want to I point those out because uh, these, these guys kind of took liberties. These are artist representations. The three errors on the wall outside are they believe that he's a little bit more streamlined than the wall. So this guy's really bulbous, real fat, and that's just poor representation. The other two um, errors on the wall are that the tail is just a little bit too long, and we're not talking the tip of the tail. We're talking about mid tail so you'd actually shorten the body up a little bit and he only had 62 conical teeth in the front half of his jaw and that thing shows his, his jaw full of teeth. By the way that's a tooth right there. You see it? Mm -hmm. So they're about that big around and they're about that long and if you guys aren't familiar with conical teeth that just think of a killer whale's teeth. Okay so ichthyosaurs um, one of the most successful animals in history, uh, we have found fossil records of ichthyosaurs on every continent except for Antarctica. <laughs> if you look right behind your head, that's Stenopterygius, and that guy was found in Germany, and he's about half size. He grows to about 8 to 10 feet in length. Uh, the reason I point him out is it turns out that Germany was a very spectacular area for finding ichthyosaurs. Uh, I've got a picture of one in here, and what they believed happened was there was a, a te some tectonic activity sealed them off in an embayment or a bay, and then the water stagnated, then the sediment settled in on top of them and they were fossilized. Well, the stagnant water is an anaerobic condition. Does anybody know what anaerobic means? No oxygen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it means lacking in oxygen, and because it takes oxygen for things to decompose, an anaerobic condition is ideal for soft tissue preservation. Mm. So if you look, you can see that this guy has his skin tissue still intact. Uh, this guy was so, um, you notice that he has a dorsal fin and um, the tail fluke now, so this guy's obviously a Jurassic ichthyosaur. The top half there was probably cartilage. Um, this particular specimen was so well preserved that they were actually able to extract pigment from the skin, so we even know what color ichthyosaurs are. <laughs> Go ahead and ask somebody. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is a big giveaway. This particular guy <laughs> was dark gray on the top, light gray on the bottom. So he looked a lot like a porpoise today. However, they found some in England that were equally well preserved that were a tortoiseshell brown, as well as some in, in the Far East like China that were an orangish brown. So they basically came in various colors. Now, uh, scientists believe that ichthyosaurs were once terrestrial and then progressed back into the ocean. Well, when they progressed back into the ocean, they experienced a release of sorts. 
and that the buoyancy of the water was helping sustain their girth. So we find that Triassic ichthyosaurs grew to these enormous sizes. Simba's pondylus was 33 feet in length, uh, Shaunosaurus 50 feet, so these guys got really big. The drawback to that is, is because the buoyancy was helping sustain their girth, they lost the ability to exit the water and lay their eggs. Remember that these guys are um, reptiles. Uh, also, they were air breathers, so they couldn't lay their eggs underwater because their offspring would drown. So they had to develop the ability to give birth to their young alive. And the term is vividary, V-I-V-I-D-A-R-Y. Uh, vividary is when reptiles give live birth. And somebody better ask me, say, <laughs> how do we know that they gave live birth? How do we know that they gave Thank live you, birth? Thank you, ma'am. You're a good helper. Here's a picture of one in the process of giving birth. <laughs> a picture. I told you we had extensive fossil <laughs> records of these guys. You can see the baby emerging right here. Notice that they emerge tail first. And they died in that exact Okay, yeah, I love it. this lady is a great helper. No, ma'am, I don't believe that this ichthyosaur died in the process of giving birth. I believe what happened was all animals tend to give their offspring as much opportunity to survive as possible. He, she was probably in a very harsh environment, maybe a stagnating pond or something, and she was dying. And it wasn't even instinctual, it was automatic. She would expel the embryo, even if it wasn't fully developed, in order to give it an opportunity to survive. And the environment was simply too harsh and the offspring died as well. Yes, sir? Do you know between a girl, boy and a girl? Absolutely. This is a girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, this is not as unusual as you guys might think. Um, it's pretty spectacular find, but it's not that unusual. If you look at the first column up there, the picture with the blue background, lower left-hand corner is this picture. The top picture, there are four within the abdominal cavity and one lying outside. So we know that they gave multiple births. And in fact, we know that they gave birth to up to eight. So, so during the transition period between egg laying and live birth giving, yeah. were they able to get back on the land? Um, probably, probably. It probably took millions of years for them to, to develop that ability. So, but you got to remember too is that uh, we're talking reptilian -like eggs, which are more leathery rather than hard shells like chickens. Okay. A um, little bit of history. Yeah. Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, I interacted. <laughs> um, up until 1928, Simba's pondylus was the largest ichthyosaur known to man. In 1928, there was a gentleman named Cy Mueller. He was a geology professor from Stanford University, and he was out here basically just doing survey work of the Shoshone mountain range. And it was rumored that the people that were living in Union Canyon, the canyon you guys drove up, were using these funny shaped rocks to prop open their doors and in the hearts of their fires and his dog bowls and dinner plates, some of them. Um, and being a geologist, he recognized that they weren't simply rocks, and so he sent one back to Stanford, and they confirmed that it was the vertebrae of an ichthyosaur. Do you guys know what your vertebrae are? Okay, somebody, basically it's your backbone. All these round bones stack up to form your backbone. Those are called vertebrae, so that's what I'm talking about right now, okay? And so they confirmed that it was the vertebrae of an ichthyosaur, and there it sat for about 25 years. Um, you gotta remember, unlike today, this was kind of a remote area. That's a... It's still remote, you guys. <laughs> Anyways, uh, in 1952, a lady named Margaret Wheat became involved. She was a, a fossil enthusiast from Fallon, Nevada, and she was an associate of Cy Mueller, so she knew about this find. And she sent this vertebrae right here back to UC Berkeley to a gentleman named Charles Camp. Uh, Dr. Camp was the head of the paleontology department at the time. And remember I told you Simba's pondylus was 33 feet in length and that the average size of an ichthyosaur is six feet? Well, this represents something a little bit in excess of 50 feet in length. So we're talking approaching twice as big as the largest known to man. So I wasn't there, but I think it's safe to assume Camp was a little excited. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> he got out here within the year, and he did an equivalent of 10 field seasons of excavation just on this quarry alone where he uncovered nine animals. Uh, <laughs> there's a tail section outside in the corner of the, of the parking lot. And up until about two months ago, I would have said 37 throughout the park. Uh, two months ago, the Discovery Channel came out, 
and they did a program on us. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady by the name of Jennifer Hogler, and she has a PhD in Shaunasaurus popularis, and I got to talk to her for about four hours. Uh, <laughs> she estimates that there's closer to 120 animals in this one, uh, I was gonna say it, it's not one square mile, in this park. Uh, <laughs> wow. I, um, I don't know how big the park is. It's not one square mile, though. I had a big argument. Anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on that note, are you guys ready to go to the quarry and see what we have here? Any questions so far? Yes. How much, when we stand here and look around, how much of this was ocean that we would see? Would we? We're talking Pangaea. We're not talking the ancient Lake Lahontan, which, which was only about 15,000 years ago. We're talking Pangaea, which is, we are the continental shelf, so to our west, is the coastline for Pangaea, and to the east is one super ocean that goes all the way around the world. So all of this was ocean. We're about 200 meters underwater. Okay. Our reptiles, reptiles tend to have a lot of hollows in their skulls, so it's typical that the skulls are in poor condition. That's one reason we give you the skull cast to look at in here. This is specimen number one, this is his skull. It's this whole area right in here. They basically didn't have a neck. This is the tip of the nose here, and this is the lower jaw. So he is, in, he is beat up a little bit. His jaws are actually ripped wide open, and in fact, they're busted back toward the body a little bit. So if we close the jaws up and we fold them away from the body the way it should be, it would extend right out here to the corner of my cabinet. Uh, Shaunasaurus popularis skull is 10 feet in length, so it's about two and a half times the size of the skull we just looked at in here. Okay. B and the red fossil right below it, those are coracoid. On you and me, a coracoid's a lot like your collarbone. On an ichthyosaur, they're more like a breastbone. It's where the flippers attach to the body. And C are the flippers. Now keep in mind, we're talking about an animal that's about 50 feet in length and weighs roughly 30 tons. <laughs> Each flipper is six and a half feet long. So we're just looking at the three primary bones of the front flipper. That's the humerus, radius, and ulna. If you look at Charles Camp's field representation of, of the skeletal structure, you'll notice that all the little round bones in the front flipper are not present here, okay? So this guy's not quite intact. So we go from B, we go up through D, which is the backbone, up to E, which is the pelvic region. Um, this right here is the femur, which is the largest bone in the back flipper. We get up to F, which is the base of the tail. Now, on an ichthyosaur, the tail is roughly a third of the total length of the animal. So we're talking about a 50-foot long animal. We should have about 16 or 17 feet of tail here. I've only got about five feet right here. That's because where I'm standing now, I'm above ground on the initial dig. All of this was dug out for you. And unfortunately, the rest of the tail was exposed to the elements and eroded away. If the tail were intact, we'd start at F, and it would extend back to about here. So now you start at my stick, you go down through D, and you end at the corner of the cabinet. And that's right at 50 feet in length. The wall outside's 56 feet long. Uh, there's nothing in the quarry that we'll see that's quite that big. Everything is between 45 and 50 feet. But of the 120 animals in the park, there were some that were in excess of 55 feet, so we can still call that life size. These guys died about 220 million years ago. The mountain range you're standing in is only about 30 million years old. So these guys were already laid down in the strata when all that tectonic activity was taking place. One of those activities was quartz, was up thrust to the surface of the earth. That's what all this white stuff is that shot right through the fossil. Okay. And another thing about specimen number one is this right here is a fault line. Can you, can you guys see this fault line right here? Okay. It's a left lateral trans. And basically what that means is you can stand and face the fault on either side of it and the shift will be to your left. And translation means it didn't change strata. So if you look, you see these ribs right here, right? Okay. The rest of them have been displaced about four feet. That's that big section up there. You'd actually pull that down about four feet. That's specimen number one. Any questions? This is specimen number two, and that's all that there's left of them. It's basically 14 vertebrae, and they're all lying flat. So what we're looking at is specimen one and two actually crossed one on top of the other, and they were laying, one was laying on top of the other. That's all that's left of them, so that's all I got to say about it. <laughs> this is specimen number three, and you guys might want to move up a little. It's okay? No? She's done. Nobody's walking out. <laughs> okay. Um, 
There were, nobody ever asks anymore, so I might as well just throw this question at you. Why, do you guys have any guess as to why we have so many animals in such a small, confined area? 120. Okay, Charles Camp introduced a theory that has since been disproven. Uh, he believed these guys might have been a, a lot like uh, a pot of whales and that they simply ran aground and were beached. And there's a couple of things in here that kind of imply that. First of all, the difference between specimen three and specimen number one. Notice on specimen one, all the vertebrae are nice and stacked and you can really tell that's a backbone, as opposed to three where all the vertebrae are lying flat and scattered all the way up the hill. Well, if these guys were ran aground and were beached, maybe scavengers came out of the forest and ate all the meat off of the bones and then the skeletal structure simply collapsed, and that's why these vertebrae are all lying flat. And maybe because one appears to be intact, maybe he was in a further state of decomposition, so they didn't eat that guy, but they ate this guy. Yeah, you'll, you'll see uh, distortions and depressions in here that has nothing to do with anything of the ichthyosaur. It's just the strata they laid down, and something might have fallen on them. It was a little bit harder, pushed it in. These guys were in the ground for about 220 million years. So. Anyways. Uh, we, now, we now know that we're about uh, 200 meters underwater, or we're convinced that we were the continental shelf. So the scavenging that took place was done by little fish. And if we look a little bit closer at specimen number one, we notice that most of the ribs, as well as the tips of the flippers, are missing. So he was probably scavenged upon as well. The reason the vertebrae appear to be intact, he simply fell on his back, and the backbone was held in place by the ground. Okay. Um, by the way, they believe now what has happened is these guys, uh, has anybody ever seen how killer whales eat? They kind of herd their prey into a small meatball, basically, and then they all leisurely strafe it, eat. They believe that these ichthyosaurs ate a lot like that, and eating together, they ingested something that was toxic to them, and they all died together. And then as they settled to the bottom of the ocean, they may have caught a crevice or a valley and they fell into that. That's the, that's the theory that's being advanced. And that's why we have such a cluster of them in such a small area. <coughs> Sorry about that. I kind of bogged down right there. Uh, <laughs> are they sometimes found singly as well? Um, or are they always in a cluster? Um, ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure that they have been found singly because right now, uh, I told you guys that Shanosaurus was the largest ichthyosaur. Uh, there's a big asterisk there because they believe they found one a little bit larger in uh, British Columbia, in Canada, um, and they haven't published yet, so we're still the largest officially, but uh, that was just a single skull, so um, they, they were pretty social though, obviously they were social. Uh, this may have been either a hunting pack or a bird area, and that's why we believe we've got such a cluster of them. What we're looking at on specimen number three, this area right in here is the pelvic region, we have the femurs on either side. I is the base of the tail. Now the tail is probably intact and present. And that means that it extends under the walkway, probably back to about that third column back there. Now you gotta remember we're talking early 50s to early 60s when this excavation was taking place. And where this young lady with the blue denim shirt on, right here, yeah, her, where she's standing, she's about eight feet underground on the initial dig. That puts me about 12 feet down, and the tail is another 15 feet below my feet. So at the time, it was simply too deep for him to excavate. Um, and just so you know, this is the way the display is set up. They probably never will excavate that tail, okay? But we do have the vertebrae and the ribs all the way up the hill. I would like to point out this rib over here, excuse me, as well as this rib right here are probably part of specimen number three. We get up to H, which is the coracoid again. And then immediately to the left of H, that's the humerus, which is the largest bone in the front flipper. Then we get up to the top of the hill. There is a skull there, and we'll look at that when we get on the other side. So you mentioned something about them possibly beaching before, but that's been... Yeah, in fact, in fact, that was Charles Camp's initial theory, was they were like a pot of whales. He, in fact, by himself, he... He, in fact, backed away from that theory at the end, so. Because the, the beach wasn't here then, is that you're saying Pangea? Yeah, we are underwater here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing is where did you get the sediment, you know, to settle in to fossilize and that type of stuff. So it was, it was kind of a bad theory, right. but. So when you're mentioning scavengers, then you're talking about other fish, obviously. That's right, I did, little fish. We're looking at this guy right here. Now this is the best representation of a skull that we have. Basically, we're looking at the top of the head at L, coming down to the tip of the nose. Above L, you see there's kind of a curvature. 
in the, in the fossil itself. It's a little too crushed to be definitive, but it's probably the eye socket, and there is another eye socket on the other side. So what we're talking about is skull has been crushed straight down. Then the jaw pitches out to the side here. You can see from M going out this direction, you can see the hinge on the end of the jaw back there. So basically what we're looking at is the skull has been crushed straight down, and then the jaw has been pitched out to the side like this. It's not lying on its side, it's straight down. And we go straight to the right, and you can see two coracoid. Is everybody following me? <laughs> no? Okay. K. Up and to the left. Up and to the left. Up and to the left. The big square rock with the crack in it. Everybody see it? Okay, up and, to, up and to the left. That's the humerus. You go up and to the left again, you see the heart-shaped rock. That's the radius. Come back to the humerus and go straight to the right. And you see two coracoid lying side by side. No? <laughs> coracoid, coracoid is it's like a breastbone. It's where the flipper attaches. You got K up and to the right. You can see two bones that go across this way. And then over here is another humerus, and it's just got the hint of three dots on it. You can't really see it right now. That's the other humerus. We get up to the top of the hill, there are vertebrae lying flat. Once we get onto the other side of the hill, we're above ground again, and the rest of the, the, rest of the um, animal has eroded away. We're going to look at this guy again on the other side, too. Uh, Charles Camp last visited the park in 1973, and he died two years later at the age of 97. So I think he kind of made it. Uh, his, his associate, Samuel Wells, came back in 1984 and did the last work on this quarry. He uncovered P, and P is a skull, and it's an independent animal. That's all there is left of him. You, never, you guys can't see it yet? Maybe? You can see it? It's over the hill. Um, yeah, so that's basically all there is, is specimen number five. This is specimen number six here. Now, um, up until now, all the animals I've been talking about, the scavenging that was done to them was done by small fish. They believe something much larger got a hold of specimen number six, maybe even a shark. Uh, that's because he's twisted and beat up pretty bad. And I'll show you what I mean in just one second. First of all, what we're looking at right here on specimen number six, that's the shoulder girdle. It's basically the front flipper assembly again. We have a coracoid here. Under the stack of vertebrae is another coracoid, a humerus over here, and a humerus over here. This humerus was sheared off by another fault line. Okay? Then we have the scapula above. Also, right here is a femur, and the other femur is way over here. They're not even close to being in proper position. So this guy did get beat up by something. Yes, sir? Do you think he would have been beat up by another ichthyosaur? Probably not. What we're talking about is all these ichthyosaurs died at the same time, so there wasn't anybody else around. And you've got to remember that ichthyosaurs are the king of the pack. So nothing else is really hunting them. They're just scavenging on them after they're dead. Then it's another one. Yeah, but these guys, we're talking about a big school of these guys, and they all, they maybe swam through a red tide or something, and they all died at the same time, so there was nothing else there. Yes, ma'am? What's a red tide? It's a toxification of the water. It comes along in February, and anyway, I don't know. <laughs> is that an organism? It probably is. It pro uh, poison? It was a toxic poison and it went right up the food chain and it didn't become toxic until it reached the top of the food chain where it accumulated because of all the animals that's been found in this quarry in the far corner upper right hand corner of that you can see all the animals that's coral oysters clams uh, all sorts of stuff up there in that corner uh, that's a typical cross-sectional rift of what you would expect to find in that environment the mass killing was specifically the ichthyosaurus the only ones large enough to eat a sufficient supply before it becomes the toxic. I actually have a book on it. I'm going to move it on it into two. It's about two teeth are about this big. Okay. But he was. Now you got to you got to remember on teeth, it, there there's uh, specialization features. Uh, for example, the conical teeth. Um, in Shaunasaurus, he only had 62 of them in the front half of his jaw. So you're talking about, dependent on a quick burst of speed, he snatches his prey and he swallows it, pretty much. Whereas we have other ichthyosaurs that have these big old fat molars in the back of their jaws for crushing like mollusks, like clams and stuff. And once we get into Jurassic ichthyosaurs, they even had some that were like strainers that swam through the water like whales and strained plankton and stuff. Anyways, so is anybody here Ever had a salmon steak? <laughs> salmon steak? Salmon steak, yeah, 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 yeah. 
basically on a salmon steak. <laughs> you take the salmon, you chop off his head, you chop off his tail, you pick up that steak and you look at it. It gives you the cross-sectional area of the rib cage. And that's what we're looking at right here. Basically the head's gone, the tail's gone, and these ribs are broken down on this side, but you can see the backbone coming down towards you. And then on this side we have an intact rib cage. Now, they look flattened out because when the sediment settled in on top of them, basically those ribs got flattened out like that. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, right at just a little bit under nine feet in length, each rib. So we're talking about an animal that's about six feet wide and nine feet thick. So you can see he's quite a bit larger than a killer whale. Moving on. This is my, I need to get in front. <laughs> uh, this is my favorite animal, so basically, there is no head, there is no flippers, so we're just going to trace the vertebrae on up the hill here. Go ahead and follow me on up. We have a slip fault right here, and then the vertebrae, you guys won't be able to see this, but you guys can. The vertebrae do an abrupt turn and go out this direction. Another slip fault, and then the vertebrae kind of bend out this way. You guys are following me, huh? Okay, this guy's my favorite animal. There's a couple reasons. First of all, everybody can see T. What T is, is the femur, or the largest bone in the back flipper. And it's finally lying in profile, so we can see the full length of that biggest bone. Also, you see all those little round rocks at the end of T? You like take them out on a lake and kind of, yeah. Those are the phalange, or the digits of the flipper. So we have almost an intact flipper right there. Furthermore, I just showed you the cross-sectional area of the ankylosaur back here. Well, when this slip fault occurred right here, it sheared off individual ribs. So I have cross-sectional area of individual ribs. That's a rib there, and there, and there, and there. Okay, good group. You can always tell by the response. Right there. <laughs> Go ahead and file by, and if you guys have any questions, just give me a call. You guys should probably go ahead and go. I'm going to end up being up here. It looks like it's going to be busy. So when you're done down there, go ahead and come on back up, and I'll finish the tour for you. Look at this. We'll this is back by there. A this is what we were we yanked out of the, our uh, thing to do. Take our little tour. We had to later. leave our our, <laughs> our talk and <laughs> look at this desert. These are his actual glasses. This is an actual book. In the very upper level, there was a device called a primary crusher, and that was like a big jaw-like device, and it worked its way back and forth like this. And the rock was fed in there, and it was reduced in size from the blasted rock to more smaller, more manageable size pieces. From there, it was carried on a conveyor belt, and it was dumped into a big hopper or bin, and from there, it was fed into one of six stamp batteries. And I don't know if anybody's looked in the mill to see what the stamps look like. But these devices were big metal uh, based and they have piston like devices that went up and down and were actually dropped on the ore. And these stamps weighed about oh, 500 to 1,000 pounds a piece and they just completely shattered the quartz and freed the gold and silver. From there the material went to amalgamation tables. These were tables that were coated with copper, and the copper was coated with mercury, and mercury has an affinity for collecting gold and silver. And that stuff turned into a paste or an amalgam. 
and that was periodically scraped off and that's what was later refined. And in the entire time this mine was in operation from about the turn of the century, about 1900, when they were really going good until 1911, when the operation closed down, they took out about $849,000 worth of gold and silver. And they were finding about 70% silver to 30% gold. And this is when silver paid about a dollar an ounce and gold paid about $20 an ounce. Does anybody have any questions? How, How did they power the pistons and the conveyor belt? They had uh, boilers, so everything was steam driven. And then there were these steam engines, you can see some of them setting up there on the hill. Yeah. And those powered belts, which went around great big uh, pulleys. How deep vertically did they go? Uh, they went down, it's just under 400 feet. Okay. Where did they get the water for the boilers and the steam pistons? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, there is a lot of water around oh, here. Okay. comes out of springs. Uh, that was one of the problems they did have here, though, is getting enough water during the dry years. Uh, there's at least one mining claim they bought, which is up back, out the uh, back end of the park, and they never mined it, they just bought it for the water rights. And they also bought a ranch 20 miles down the valley uh, for the water rights. And they just about closed the mine down, took all the miners out and had them land pipe. So water was a problem. And it's also known as the Walter Bowler Tunnel, and we're really not sure why it has two names. <laughs> Possibly Diana was uh, Walter Bowler's daughter's name. Uh, does anybody have any idea why the miners would dig a tunnel right there? Outcropping in the well. there was something underneath. Exactly. Uh, you can tell that white rock up on the hill. Uh, that was a solid outcropping of quartz. And backing up a little bit now, you had asked about how the formation came to be there. Uh, these mountains are about 30 million years old, and maybe the mountains weren't even here yet. But at one time, there were giant fissures in the earth, and liquid quartz under extreme pressure was forced up into those fissures, where it cooled and solidified. And liquid quartz will piggyback. Uh, and what they did was uh, took some samples and had those samples assayed and apparently there were paying values of gold and silver. The next step was to come back and see which way that quartz went underground. And it does come over the top of the tunnel. And it's the same thing with the mill. They were going to have gravity help them out a little bit. It's a lot easier to tunnel underneath your body and then dig down into the bottom of it as opposed to removing material from a hole that keeps getting deeper and deeper. But this is what's known as a false lead. And false leads were quite common uh, in hard rock mining during this period in history. And you can see here, there's some of the original pick marks where they were just chiseling away at the softer material. And this tool right here is kind of interesting, this shovel. This was bent like this on purpose, because what they used this for was to keep the track clear of debris that would spill on the floor. So the ore carts would freely roll in and out. And we're not going too much further here until we come to the surveyor state. And you can see now we're getting into the hard rock center of the mountain. Pretty much everything we've gone through so far was probably dug out by hand, where here they had to start blasting. <coughs> and we have our first timber set here. And we have to get everybody on this side of it turned around facing the way we came in, and you'll see why that timber set was placed there. <laughs> uh, if you look up to your right, that is a fault, mm. and that is why that timber set has been placed there. Uh, those timbers aren't holding up the mountain. They're more or less there as a monitoring device. If excessive pressure was bearing down on that wood, it would start to creak and groan. The wedges would curl and crack, and we would know we had a problem there. And the wood will let you know what's going on. It'll talk to you for a long time before it fails. Okay. 
and then the miners decided that they weren't going to be going in or out anymore. So they dumped a lot of waste rock here in the opening. And this is called backfilling, and this is very common in hard rock mining. It saved a lot of time and effort, a lot of hard work, instead of pushing ore cart after ore cart load out with waste rock and dumping it down the hill, they just deposited the material right here. So now to the tools. The way they advanced the tunnel and worked the ore face in the early days was they used hand steel. This is a drill. And they used a hammer. This is called a single jack hammer. These weighed oh, three to five pounds, depending on the miner using it, whatever his preference was. And they didn't just arbitrarily drill a series of holes. They actually planned it out, and it depended on the hardness of the rock, how big their tunnel was, and what they were doing. And that's how they lowered and raised that big iron bucket. And you can see it slid up and down the hole on those wooden runners. But before they had these, uh, the power drills were powered by steam. And the miners really didn't like them when they first came out. Uh, they weighed about 300 pounds. They were hissing and whatnot. Sometimes the hoses would break or the connectors would come apart. And I don't know if you've ever let go of uh, a water hose with water going full blast. It starts whipping around. Well, the same thing would happen with those steam hoses. Uh, then they came up with the drill that was powered by compressed air. This is too powerful and too heavy to hang on to manually, so it is mounted in this carriage. And then you turn the crank, oh, it's backing it up, and you can see it's going forward toward the rock. It has to be jacked into place. And the utility line that we talked about when we first came in the mine, it has followed us here. Well, an air hose would run off that utility line and it would connect to the drill here. And then you have an on and off switch and you turn it on and this <coughs> drill bit would reciprocate or go back and forth. And then you would turn the crank and it would move the carriage forward and you would start drilling your hole. Well this is called drilling dry and there was a problem. Compressed air went in here, it had to come out somewhere. And where it came out was through the end of the drill tip. So when they were drilling, all this dust was blowing back in their face. And quartz is a lot like glass. It contains sure. silica. And if you breathe enough silica, you'll get a condition called silicosis or miner's consumption. And it's a very painful death. Uh, your lungs are unable to take in or you're unable to absorb oxygen anymore. And in the Tonopah area, that was a, a really serious problem. There were miners in their 20s that had been mining for oh, two, three, four years, and they were dying of silicosis. Mm -hmm. Now this area up in the hole here, this is called a scope. And there they were actually mining the ore body. And as they were blasting, the material would fall down behind this wooden device here, this ore chute. And as it collected behind it, then they would wheel their ore cart up, open the gate, fill up, shut the uh, gate, and push it on out. They wanted to find as large a seam of ports as possible, because I think you get the idea that uh, drilling was very labor intensive, and the blasting was very expensive. Now this is another way, uh, way where they gained access to that stoke. And here we can see some timbers. Uh, once again, these aren't holding the mountain up. There are just <laughs> some loose areas in the ceiling, and that is their sole purpose, is just to hold up those loose spots. And this beam right here, you can see this slab with the big crack in it, right above where you're standing? <laughs> That's why that is there. And here's a little bit more mining terminology. We can see the quartz seam up here. Mm -hmm. The material above that is called the hanging wall, and the material below that quartz seam is called the foot wall. Now here the quartz vein ran downhill, and of course they dug it out. 
And they didn't go down here very far, but it does look like after they got done mining in this area, they did some backfilling here. You can see all the broken waste rock deposited here. And this was just put here for display purposes. Uh, this is a Chinese mining ladder. Uh, there were really no records of any Chinese miners here. But uh, when the railroad building in the West ended, there were a lot of Chinese laborers that found themselves unemployed, and they went into hard rock mining. Their primary light source when they were drilling with hand steel. Uh, does everybody want to turn their lights off? And turn your light off, Carly. Okay. So if we were double jacking, it would be about two men and two candles. So the lighting wasn't the best. Does anybody want to see what? Boy, you turned your flashlight on. <laughs> <laughs> do you want? Do you want? Do you want to experience total darkness in the morning? Absolutely. Okay. Well, here we no. go. Yes. Thank <laughs> you.